Hey, hey, guess who, psychic children? It's me, May. That's right, back with another video. Yeah, you thought I was done? No, I've got other videos to make as well. I've been making videos for like 10 fucking years. David. Lynch. I'm sure you're familiar. Uh, I have mentioned David Lynch's name on my YouTube channel many, many, many times, but I'm going to go out on a loom and assume that you don't know a thing about the man. Who is this man? What is this strange hair he dons? And would he be a delicate lover? I don't know the answer to any of these questions. But Isabella Rossellini probably does. Because they were married once upon a time. That's an in-joke if you know anything about the life and times of David Lynch. David Lynch is a filmmaker, but it's a little weird to call him a filmmaker because he's not really a filmmaker. He's a mixed media artist man. He pulls things from other mediums and brings them into film and through doing so kind of explores different aspects of the human experience that dry, regular narrative can't really achieve. So David Lynch's movies work on a more emotionally complex level than they maybe do on a narratively dramatic level. Okay, that was kind of a shitty thing to say. Okay, that's not entirely true. Like, David Lynch's movies are very well made. I mean, they're very well written, they're very well put together, and they're great movies. But I think for most people, expecting a very specific subsect of things when they go into a movie are going to be sorely disappointed when they watch a David Lynch movie and realize that he just didn't put any of those things in there. He doesn't like bullshit, David Lynch. He likes his bullshit, and he's on that bullshit 24-7. But once upon a time, he was like you and me, just some person that you stumbled upon one day. Once upon a time, David Lynch was painting. He was just sitting there minding his own business painting when he looked at the painting and he noticed that it started to move and he had an idea. Moving painting, like a movie. <laughs> So because of this, he decided to make Eraserhead. Okay, that's a very oversimplification. He actually made a whole bunch of short films. He moved from Philadelphia to uh, LA, and he went to the American Film Institute, and in the basement of the American Film Institute, he made Eraserhead. Over the course of many, many years, starring Jack Nance, who you might know from Twin Peaks, as well as everybody else that you might know from Twin Peaks. David Lynch has a tendency to work with the same cast members, so you're gonna be seeing them a lot. We're talking about a movie that ignores all convention of film, and instead creates its own. David Lynch came out swinging with his first film, and that's why I'm going to give it an A. So if you don't know anything about Eraserhead, it's a movie about a guy who has a baby with a lady, and the lady is like, it's a premature baby, and the guy's like, oh no. Anyway, the baby ends up being like a cow fetus instead of a human being, and they can't determine exactly where or how it exists, but nevertheless, it is alive and therefore must be taken care of. So, enter daddy. <laughs> but Henry doesn't just have to take care of a baby, no, he has to take care of his own mind, because like slowly but surely, his reality begins slipping away. Seriously, probably half of this movie is, is visual images that you have to interpret yourself, and you're given no narrative indicators as to what these things could possibly mean. A lot of people get very frustrated by analyzing David Lynch's movies because of this, so I'm going to once again just introduce the concept of semiotics, the study of signs and symbols. Sometimes David Lynch is gonna have blonde women in his movies. These are kind of like a weird, like, kind of a Marilyn Monroe thing he's doing, and sometimes he'll have an opposing character have brown hair and this is supposed to be like a Jackie O. Huh? Marilyn? Jackie O? Kennedy? Come on. Come on, we've all seen this before. So semiotics are going to end up playing a huge role in understanding his films as we go on. In an interesting twist, Mel Brooks <laughs> took a look at Eraserhead. Hey, this is fantastic. I'm gonna give this guy all of my money. So David Lynch made The Elephant Man, starring Anthony Hopkins and uh, which I'm going to give a B. 
I feel like David Lynch's sophomore effort, like while being very, very good, I do believe this won Academy Awards. It's a little bit more dramatically sound than it is like metaphysically sound. It occurred to him at some point that he had to make movies for people to watch uh, that weren't just gonna be nonsense for people to look at and not understand what they were seeing. So he decided to be clear. <laughs> Which isn't to say that The Elephant Man is bad, it's a great movie as it is a B tier. It's just not quite on the level of some of his other things because he doesn't quite take it off the deep end as much as he does later on. Unfortunately for David, it takes a little while for him to really find himself in all of this because his next film is Dune. Oh boy. So there is a remake of Dune coming out, and I sure hope it's good. Dune is notoriously difficult to adapt, as multiple people have tried it and multiple people have failed, including David Lynch, many would argue. Uh, the film is produced by Dina De Laurentiis, and if you know anything about Dina De Laurentiis, uh, you know that he, he, well, I don't know if he was the right man for the job. And honestly, that's kind of how David feels in this movie too. Like it feels like David has a hard time gelling with the source material. Eraserhead, for all the things that I've said about it, is ultimately kind of a science fiction movie about his time living in Philadelphia and how horrible it must have been to live there and deal with all that bullshit. So Dune kind of... Yeah. It just, it lacks a certain je ne sais quoi. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I think one of the weirder parts of the movie is how frequently in the movie it will just cut to people's inner thoughts and sometimes their inner thoughts are really kind of, kind of, kind of banal and dumb. And you're like, why are you telling me this? See, David Lynch is like also weirdly psychologically ex obsessed. I, I don't know if this is necessarily like true to him. I haven't met the man, but in his films, he clearly has an understanding of like some level of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis mixed with other things that are previously non-psychoanalytical. He's got everybody's inner thoughts as a way to psychoanalyze all the characters, which kind of gives him that certain je ne sais quoi that he likes so much. It spices up his soup. It's a little sriracha for your Dune movie. I mean, there there are a lot of good things to like about this. Kyle MacLachlan is in it, we love him. The, the, the oh, uh, Sting is so hot in this film. While I will say this is probably one of the lesser David Lynch films, I'm gonna give it a B. <laughs> I feel like if it were David, David wouldn't even talk about it. <laughs> but if David did, he'd probably give it a C or a B. So I'm gonna go with a B because I love you, David. I wouldn't ever wanna upset you. I like your movies, even when they kinda suck. Blue Velvet could not be further from any of the other installments on this tier list so far. Blue Velvet is really the movie where I feel like David Lynch came into his own. Long-winded, kind of weird, take on Reagan's America, which is to say that it's like great on the outside, but on the underbelly, there's like rape and torture and abuse and like women are mistreated and everyone's marginalized. There's big monster men who do whatever they want to everybody and get completely away with it. Sort of a society sort of thing. Sort of a Joker sort of thing there, David. Blue Velvet is, is one of my favorite films I've ever seen in my life. I, I watched it this morning, to tell you the truth. I watched it this morning. No, I've seen this movie like a hundred times. This one time I got in a shouting match with somebody in film school about it. Yeah, I went to film school, and when I went to film school, I got in a shouting match with somebody about Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet is kind of the perfect balance for David in that it's very surreal. A lot of it is kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it nonsensical. I would call it metaphorical, but it's so deep in the in the tissue of the metaphor. Uh, it requires one of them old semiotics that I was talking about. Use those, you'll, you'll get it. But this movie really comes across like David finally just being like, okay, fuck y'all. I'm gonna do the movie I wanna do now. It very much feels like a, a spiritual successor to something like Eraserhead, where he's starting off his career with like this idea of like visualizing these very intense metaphorical aspects of, of the human existence. So less about telling me a story and more about telling me a story. 
there's this great bit of David Foster Wallace talking about this movie where he talks about it, it being a kind of surrealism that had never really been seen before up to this moment. Yes, we have a razor head, but, but blue velvet is like a very American kind of surrealism and absurdism that abstracting things that we have all come to accept at this point. So David Lynch kind of gets this keen awareness for how to criticize American culture while also doing it in a way that's super like incognito. You'll love it. We're going to keep going. Oh, I forgot to rate this one. Uh, this is a double S for me. We got it all. We got Kyle MacLachlan. We got Laura Dern. We got uh, oh my god, Dennis Hopper is here. Fucking Roger Ebert didn't like it. Isabella Rossellini is a queen and fantastic in it. It's weirdly Freudian. Uh, and there's a lot of weird psychoanalysis shit in it. It's kind of neat. You'd like it. Wild at Heart is his follow-up to Blue Velvet, where he's once again adapting a story instead of like writing his own completely new story. But his version of Wild at Heart is a little bit different than you might assume. David Lynch loves, 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 loves The Wizard of Oz. Literally, he's just remade The Wizard of Oz over and over and over again. Person slips into fantasy world, they experience crazy things, and they go back having learned some deeper analytical thing about the human experience. David loves The Wizard of Oz. It's in all of his fucking movies, but it's really in Wild at Heart. Yeah, so there's like a whole bunch of weird parallels between Wizard of Oz and Wild at Heart, but Wild at Heart is kind of the edgy, more brutalistic version of a very similar kind of story that does a similar kind of thing. Ultimately, both are road movies, Wild at Heart being a road movie about getting away from Laura Dern's crazy mother, who will absolutely murder Sailor Ripley at any opportunity that she gets. And Sailor Ripley, of course, is played by Nicolas Cage, who at this time in American history was a heartthrob. Does he have sex in this film? He does. This is the part where May reveals that she kind of has a lady boner for Nicolas Cage. People are gonna be kind of peeved about that. <laughs> no, I mean, how can you not love him though? He's like, this is my snakeskin jacket. It expresses my individuality. I'm totally in no way like Elvis whatsoever. Wild at Heart is quite a trip and I'm going to have to put it in the A tier. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't quite give it an S because every time I've watched this with friends, they usually get bored of it, even though I genuinely love it. Unfortunately, sorry, David, I love it. The Palm Door. You got the Palm Door for this one. Take the A. It's okay. You will have other things. I wasn't going to do any TV shows uh, because David Lynch has a lot of short films. He has a lot of TV stuff. Uh, he did Dumb Land, which is notably something I've never seen. It's kind of rare to pick up, but that's a TV thing that he did. But he's primarily known for his role on Twin Peaks, which without a doubt is a double S show. There's nothing wrong with Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks is sort of a Blue Velvet kind of toned itself down and met true crime a bit, but the character work is phenomenal because the entire thing is kind of a spoof on soap operas. Okay, that's like a gross oversimplification of exactly what was being achieved with Twin Peaks is that the soap opera model doesn't necessarily care about what drama happens because any drama can happen so long as we love the characters we will love the drama. The same idea is transferred right over to Twin Peaks. If we love the characters, we'll love the drama. And in doing so, David Lynch kind of has the opportunity to explore a lot of themes of like American heroism, the American small town, industry, and how it works on like a smaller scale and also capitalism on a smaller scale. He uses Twin Peaks to talk about a lot of the rough experiences that women have. He makes a big point to be like, hey, systemic issues are a thing. Here are evidence of the systemic issues. But also Twin Peaks is a collaborative effort, which is what makes it amazing, truly. I mean, you got Duane editing and occasionally directing. You got Angelo on the score. Mm. Hi, Angelo. You're so good at this. I'm gonna be so sad when Angelo goes. Fucking bury me when Angelo goes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just firing at all cylinders. And of course, like, 
all of the David Lynch regulars are here. Catherine Coulson is here. Jack Nance makes an appearance. I mean, even as far back to Eraserhead, he's still working with the same people on the same little projects. They carry each other all the way here. And then what they do together is better than like pretty much anything they ever did apart. Unfortunately, Twin Peaks has a sordid past, which you're pretty aware of at this point, I'm sure. But if you are not, famously, studio execs made David Lynch reveal who the killer was in Twin Twin Peaks and basically fucked the whole show. See, the whole bit of the show was going to be that we never found out who killed Laura Palmer. We were just going to experience the town through their grief and then upon getting into the grief we learn exactly what's going on within the town and like exactly how fucked up the American town is. And we just don't get that because the show's way too obsessed with its own mystery. But that ends up being for the show's strength later on when the show's lore becomes so nonsensical that it just continues to fall down the nonsense rabbit hole until just about every lay viewer that was watching Twin Peaks from like episode one doesn't even know what the fuck is going on anymore. <laughs> it's like doing the thing that killed the show but then doing it as a bit. We'll get there. Either way, I'm gonna give Twin Peaks season one and two an S. <laughs> season two is really, really good until it isn't. And the reason that it isn't is because David Lynch fucking left. He was like, sorry guys, if I'm not going to be doing the show the way that God intended, I think I'm going to get out of here. Uh, many years later, it's worth mentioning that David Lynch directed Twin Peaks Firewalk With Me. So Twin Peaks Firewalk With Me is the story of Twin Peaks, but inverted. We're now experiencing the story of Twin Peaks through Laura's eyes, like right before everything happens with like a smattering of little extra detailed things that would end up coming into play and being important in Twin Peaks The Return. Ultimately, this movie is a lot more hardcore than anything that was on Twin Peaks and it, it has a lot more in common with like a Blue Velvet or a Wild at Heart than it does with Twin Peaks. Even though it does feature the cast of Twin Peaks and they are phenomenal in it, I'm still going to give it an A because personally, eh, eh. <laughs> I feel like the one thing that I don't like about Twin Peaks Firewalk With Me is that everything David Lynch is doing in it, I wish was happening to a different character or a different subsect of characters in a weird way. I like the drama in the movie. I guess I just don't know how I feel about it congealing with Twin Peaks as a concept. Even though Firewalk With Me has gone on to be pretty much favorable in the Twin Peaks fandom, people do really like it. There was a time where people didn't like it and they didn't like it because it didn't provide them the answer that they were hoping they would get. Fortunately, David Lynch would later on go on to direct Twin Peaks season three, which would answer none of those questions and pr provide even further questions. Isn't that great? We love more questions. So I'm going to steal some of my opinions on Lost Highway from David Foster Wallace, who I really like. I don't, I don't know why am I like this. David Foster Wallace once said that on the set of Lost Highway, besides David Lynch drinking a whole lot of coffee and constantly having to run off to pee behind trees, he also kind of had this bent in him about self-control. At some point in David Lynch's career, I guess it probably would have been around the Dune time period, wouldn't it have? David kind of caught this Thing about his own self-control. I would like to have entire creative control over everything I make, and I ultimately would like to be in charge of the points that it makes and how those things are fulfilled on screen. So because of this, Lost Highway feels a little bit like he's gripping it. Maybe. Perhaps this is vague, but if you watch the movie and, and you've seen, you know what I mean? Tell me. It's not quite as hands-off and as, as relaxed and as, as genuinely good as like Mulholland Drive, but it is still fantastic. I'm not saying that Lost Highway isn't a good movie. I feel like it's a great movie. I would put it in the A tier. <laughs> And also a lot of the people that David decided to work with on the film were kind of 90s choices. Like he was looking around at a lot of like industrial music. I don't know why, but he never, I guess he didn't think, dang, I don't know if this is gonna last forever. Maybe this will be weird one day. That to say, I mean, one of the actors is a murderer, so he couldn't have possibly known that was going to happen either. Basically what I'm saying is David Lynch is many things, but he is not psychic and he didn't know that 
industrial music was kind of eventually kind of get a little lame and also uh that 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 man was gonna murder somebody although i will say if out of all of david lynch's movies the two i rewatch the least are probably the elephant man and lost highway which isn't to say that lost highway is bad it's just to say it's a little dated i love all of his movies don't crucify me please okay so did you know did you know did you know? Yes, of course you knew. David Lynch directed a movie for Disney once. That's right, he did. The hair on my nose. Yeah, get off of there. Yeah, David Lynch directed a movie for Disney and it's pretty good. It's about a man who is lawn mowing his way across uh, uh, the United States. And it's called The Straight Story and it is a straight story. It does not, there's no bullshit. As I said before, David Lynch loves a lot of things, but bullshit is not one of them. He takes his, his sweet effort in removing all bullshit from his stories. So Disney's like, here's a straight up sort of deal for you. And he's like, I'm gonna knock that out of the park and it's gonna be a straight up deal. So Mulholland Drive is my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> I say that about like six or seven different things every single week, but I think I actually mean this one because like, if you go back in my life, I have watched Mulholland Drive too many times and always for the most important of reasons. If I miss out on my Mulholland Drive time, I'm gonna be a little bit angy and you wouldn't like me when I'm angy. Fabulous movie about two women who might be the same woman, or might be in love with each other, or who fucking knows, man? Mahon Drive is great to analyze because there are probably like three or four pretty solid analytical takes of it that mean completely different things, and I love that. I have my own particular opinion on it, and I've considered making an analysis video on exactly what I think is going on in Mahon Drive, but I have watched as everybody else has made analysis videos about how amazing Mulholland Drive is. So for some reason, my, my little fingers, I haven't been able to get my fingers on that one. Mulholland Drive follows the story of someone who's lost their identity and they end up in like an LA house with a upcoming starlet and then they kind of fall in love. Over the course of it, they realize that there is something very, very wrong with both of them and their identity and the reality in which they live. LA itself, everybody they've ever known, by the end of it, they've realized that the entire whole of society is pretty much against them and that there is really no answer for their life. It's one of the most depressing things I've ever seen. And it's also a really super depressing story about being gay. But besides being a story about being a lesbian and how scary that is for me, it's also a story Story that that very succinctly talks about the trope of gay people dying at the end of stories and fridging your gaze or fridging relationships or things like that. It ends up being a movie that more eloquently describes the downfall of a relationship between two people than maybe anything else. I love the bit that David does where he will put an evil into a character at the very beginning of the movie. Throughout the entire movie, you can feel something, but you never know what it's gonna be. And then at the end, it's revealed. And it's not so much that you you think, oh wow, this is a plot twist, and I'm Bruce Willis was a ghost? And more like a, okay, now I understand what David Lynch was trying to say about humanity as a whole. Mulholland Drive is that movie, uh, and he does it so perfectly that I think this was the one that all the critics were like, this is the greatest movie of the 21st century or whatever, 20th century, whoever, whatever. <laughs> that particular decade, the 2000s, was it the decade of the 2000s? See, I can see that one, but hold on now, let's not get crazy. It's not the greatest thing that anyone ever did in history. It's just one of the greatest things that anyone ever did in history. Needless to say, Mulholland Drive gets a double S from me. It's one of the greatest movies ever. If I could give it a triple S, I would, but I don't think that that exists. I also understand that my scale is a little fucked up because there's like S tier stuff and double S tier stuff and A tier stuff, but hardly anything lower than that. And that's because David's great and I love him. <laughs> David, will you read me the weather? Please. I would love it if he would read me the weather. <laughs> I would cry my eyes out if David Lynch one day read me the weather. That would be fabulous. We could meditate about it. Inland Empire is a fucking nightmare and 
I feel like most people would have a hard time putting this somewhere on the list because this movie is kind of less a movie, more an SCP. Does that make sense? So yeah, Inland Empire is a three hour long experimental film shot on, believe it was the, the PD-150, but I'm about to be wrong and everyone's gonna make fun of me. What camera was Inland Empire shot on? Sony DSR PD-150. According to Wikipedia, oh, Inland Empire- It is the PD-150! Go fuck yourself, show. internet! That's the last time anybody ever tells me I'm wrong about cameras. That's right. So, depending on who you ask, this is either the greatest thing they've ever seen or the worst thing they've ever seen. Beyond that, yeah, it, it's all shot on pretty dated video. It does kind of feel a little home recording adjacent, but with like- you know, nicer lenses and whatnot, but everything feels very at a distance and strange. David Lynch talks about filming on this being very freeing for him because he felt like the digital technology kind of let him play more than film ever let him play. And that's very obvious based on the movie you see where he's doing shit that he's never even tried before. These things that he discovered on Inland Empire kind of make him the SCP that we know him to be these days. This is like a three hour long film meant to test and see if you have lost your fucking marbles. And the reality is yes. You have, because you've watched all three hours of it. So I'm going to create a new category for the tier list, which is question, 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 and I'm gonna put Inland Empire there. Because what the fuck is Inland Empire even? I mean, there are a lot of good analysis videos about it, and I've read this, this fabulous essay once upon a time uh, that helps me understand exactly what it was. And also none of it is all that complicated in that he closes all of his loops in the story. You know, he tells a cohesive, coherent story, but he does so in such a long-winded fashion with so many bells and whistles, with so much nonsense added that you kind of question what it even is. And by the time you reach the end, you don't even trust it. Like the last 30 minutes of the movie, as, as fucked up and horrifying as they are, I don't believe it's ending. Until I see the, the, the ending, I don't believe it's ending. That movie is one of very few movies that's kind of like that Ikea SCP where it can just go on forever and ever and ever and you will never notice. So I've decided to put this one in the cryptid category <laughs> or the SCP category because David Lynch has got to be the only filmmaker to have ever made an SCP instead of a movie. <laughs> And we are going to finish off with Twin Peaks The Return. I am going to give this a double S because David Lynch is, is at the end of his career, I suppose, but I, I think that's unfair to say. I think it's unfair to call this the end of his career when he's doing more with his career now than it seems like he's ever done before. He has a new show coming out on Netflix. That's gonna be fabulous. He seems to be working all the time these days. And who's complaining? Not me. <laughs> Twin Peaks The Return is the third season of Twin Peaks where uh, 25 years later, David Lynch just got his digital know-how together and got his crew together and got his cast together and they were like, all right, we're gonna do what we did in Inland Empire for television. So the whole season of it is just so much. Like every scene lingers for a really long time, carries with it this this dread, but the dread is almost hysterical. Like sometimes you can't help but laugh throughout the majority of the show. And he challenges so many ideas. It genuinely feels like he's cramming an idea into every single scene of the movie as if he knows that he wants to get every single thing out of his mind and onto camera as possible. And in the behind the scenes of this, you can see his frustrations at his inability to, to fully commit to doing this. Like, he wants so bad to have the freedom to make the longest, most unwatchably crazy as fuck thing anyone has ever made and every producer ever has been like, David, you've got to stop. So one of these days, I think it would be super spicy if somebody just let David truly, truly, truly just 
go wild. Just go wild. Just hand him all the money he wants to let him see what'll, what'll come out of that old noggin of his. That's kind of gonna do it for the David Lynch tier list. This is, this is my tier list. This isn't to say that this is objective. Like, obviously, this is opinions, and I'd love to see your tier list. I'm sure you have uh, strong opinions about all of these. If you don't have strong opinions about them, I would be amazed. I feel like most people have very strong opinions about these or no opinion whatsoever on David Lynch. So I'm curious to see what your tier list is, please comment below and let me know uh, where you feel like things should go. And make sure and give it a like and subscription. Now, before we go real quick, while Patreon names are listing, let's do a short film lightning round. Let's go. Six men getting sick. Okay, so this one came out like at the very, very, very beginning of his career. And it's like, it's super short. And it literally is only a few minutes. And it is a visualization of that idea that I was saying at the very beginning, like a moving painting. So it is a moving painting. It's just six guys over the course of time, like getting sick and, and bleeding. And, and it's, yeah, it's gross. And there's like a, an alarm. And yeah, it's mostly video art, which video art wasn't really so much a thing until much later. But at this particular time, I would call this video art, even though objectively it was film and also objectively this this is a lot better than most video art I've seen. Okay, uh, Catherine Coulson sits in a chair and has an amputated leg. Somebody comes up to clean it, but then blood just starts shooting out all over the place while she's on the phone. It's, it's very Lynchian in that, like, I didn't talk about this in the video super a lot, but the concept of something being Lynchian is when the mundane exists within the terrifying. So it's not so much that somebody is like, losing their mind or is is in terror as much as they're losing their mind and in terror and they're cooking hot dogs or they're losing their mind and they're killing somebody and they're in terror but if they don't remember to feed their dog they're really going to have a hard time you know what i mean it's it's like it's like the combining of things that are hideously horrible that we can't imagine with things that are just mundane and are just everyday average so the amputee is basically that it's katherine colson has an amputated leg uh, someone comes to dress the wound, but then it starts to spew blood everywhere, but she's on the phone, so it's Lynchian. <laughs> the Cowboy and the Frenchman. This is a weird movie about people not being able to communicate. Harry Dean Stanton, we love him. Um, so, like, David Lynch has this cowboy aspect to him, and I love when it comes out, but it very rarely comes out, and it, this is, like, this is the one, like, it's, it's, it's kind of his western, if he was to do a western, it's, it's not much of a western, but it's pretty phenomenal, and you should check it out. Um, I'm, uh, yeah. And that ought to do it. Thank you all so much for being here, and I'll see you next time.